Hello, this is going to be a review video dealing with World War I, uh, in particular America's role in World War I, but we are going to need to kind of touch upon the European side of things as well um, before we dive into America in particular. During the lead-in to World War I, you really had a sense of inevitability about this all. Uh, you know, these troubles had been brewing for really quite some time in Europe, and many people kind of attributed this, and they all called this kind of a powder keg, if you will. Um, it wasn't really a matter of if, it was a matter of when something would actually happen that would spark this type of conflict. And some of the really, the, the reasons that you had this sentiment going around uh, are a number of different reasons actually. Uh, for starters, you have this this idea of nationalism. You have these nation states that have grown you know tremendously and in doing so you have this this intense loyalty that individuals gain you know towards their nation, uh, towards their country. And you have other things like colonization, you know, spreading the the power of these nations on a global scale. You know, you have Europeans carving up Africa and Asia, and America is getting involved in Asia too. Um, so, you know, the this carving up of these different areas worldwide just kind of almost proves to these people, these Europeans, that on some level they are better than these areas of the world, and that kind of it continues to make you feel good about being part of your particular country. Um, elsewhere, you had unification of, of different states as well. Uh, you have German unification in the late 1800s as well as the Italian unification. Uh, so you now you actually have Germany and you have Italy as actual individual nation states versus kind of kingdoms, and that's going to also play a major role in all of this because, you know, the different kingdoms uh, of Germany and you know Prussia to separate they were you know obviously formidable but when you bring the two of them together you're going to now all of a sudden have a country that essentially rivals all the other states all the other nation states in in Europe as well and that kind of happens almost overnight that you have these two countries you know come together and form into the, the unified country of Germany um, and that's going to be a major kind of worry for all of these states in Europe and going forward. I have this little cartoon here uh, you know dealing with nationalism and you know this blind following in some cases uh, in this nationalistic pride you, know, you have this person with the flag uh, kind of like lemmings leading these people off of the cliff and they're just kind of blindly following the flag uh, and with their loyalty and you know they're following it and they're going to be following it to their inevitable doom here which kind of sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about uh, momentarily I also just wanted to show a map of global imperialism you know at the start of World War One and kind of what the world looked like based off of the carving up of of these kind of other areas in the world, you know, in particular in Africa and in particular, you know, in Asia. Uh, but, you know, it's really important because these are going to become a, a major source of tension between the different European powers, right? If you have, um, you know, fighting over kind of colonial possessions in Africa and, you know, who's going to take the most here, um, you know, the, they're going to get some boundary disputes and kind of different areas of dispute as well in in Africa that's going to kind of help lead to the tensions growing at home in in Europe itself and with those growing tensions you're gonna come to the other aspects that are gonna kind of help lead the world into the First World War. Uh, the other aspect is this kind of idea of militarism. And the definition of militarism is simply just, you know, if one country increases its military strength, you know, the rivals are going to really feel threatened and ultimately build up their military in response. You know, they're all looking to protect their own interests, whether these interests be their colonial possessions or just simply their what they control in Europe as well. Uh, so you're going to get kind of th these mo this militarism on these borders and people are just going to be looking to protect themselves and that's going to lead to people getting worried about 
how their future interactions with these different nations might go. And that brings us to the other aspect of this, which is, is something that's known as the entangling alliance system. You know, when it comes down to it, each country was really hoping to not go to war, uh, and they did this by kind of having backup. You know, you're going to have all these different agreements with other countries that basically they're saying, you know, if you go to war, I will help you, or vice versa, uh, and that kind of is meant to act as a preventative, because if you know for a fact you know, you're going to have someone else coming into this war, you're going to be a little less likely to just attack that one person. This is a clear graphic of kind of what the entangling alliances looked like at the time of the start of World War I. Uh, and this is really important. You're going to get two different uh, real alliances. One is called the Triple Entente, and the other is the Triple Alliance. So let's just look at the Triple Alliance first. Uh, you know, the Triple Alliance encompasses three different nation states at the time. Uh, the first one is Italy. Uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary. Germany is the real powerhouse here, um, you know, of this this group, and they're going to be the driving factor going forward in the war. Um, and if Germany wasn't in there, they they, they totally would have folded a lot sooner. Um, but Austria-Hungary as well, um, you know, is another major part of this. And not, you know, Italy is going to actually step away from them once the war starts and join the opposite side. But you know, at this time they had these agreements and. Once the at the events um, you know of July actually take place in 1914, um, it's going to bring everything together, and I'll explain that in a second. But you know, on the other side, you have Russia, uh, France, and Great Britain as well. And you know, the really solid alliance you have is between Russia and France that you can see in green, kind of right where my mouse is here. Um, so that basically, there's an agreement there, right? If this war ever happens, we're going to back each other up. Uh, but the the wild card here is Great Britain. Uh, you know, they don't have necessarily a firm alliance with either of these countries, and it's going to become questionable whether or not they're actually going to get in the war at all, um, looking to kind of get, keep themselves out of it because of how the devastating effects of something like this could actually have. Uh, ultimately, we do know that Britain's going to get involved in the war. I'm going to explain, you know, why momentarily. Um, but the other wild card here is the group known as the Ottoman Empire, which today is really the Turks or Turkey. Um, but they're going to come into play, too, in this when it all shakes out once this war happens. And I'm going to explain the sides and the way it's going to actually break down once the war starts soon. The question becomes, however, you know, what is actually going to set this all off? And the answer to that is... An actual really, really fascinating story. Um, it involves the heir to the Austria-Hungarian Empire and his assassination in Serbia. Uh, so his name is Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and he was on a state visit to one of the territories of the Austria-Hungarian Empire in Serbia. And while he was there, you actually had this nationalist group, uh, the Serbian nationalist group, that doesn't really have anything to do with the Serbian government at all, um, feeling that they were looking for their kind of independence from the Austria-Hungarian Empire, and this group was known as the Black Hand. Uh, and when they learn that the Archduke is actually going to be coming to Serbia, they come up with a plot to kill him. And the the story goes you know you have the archduke come to you know come to serbia and as he's traveling through the city of sarajevo uh you basically have this this line of these conspirators basically ready to to kill the archduke uh and as he's as the archduke is traveling along this route you actually have the first conspirator throw a essentially a um, what comes to a bomb at his car, and it actually bounces off the, the back of the car of the Archduke uh, and actually hurts the car and blows up the car behind them, uh, but it's essentially a failed kind of deal. Uh, the Archduke and, you know, his car actually goes, you know, gets away, gets speeding away, um, and the first conspirator actually, in an attempt not to 
be captured, uh, he actually had taken a cyanide capsule and actually jumped off of a nearby bridge, uh, thinking he would die and drown, and you know, it, ultimately he wouldn't be captured. Um, Interesting enough that the cyanide that they took uh, wasn't enough of a dose to kill them, and it just made them sick, and the bridge that he actually jumped off um, was only in a couple feet of water, so he actually just breaks his legs, and he's ultimately captured. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, the Archduke, you know, they get him to safety, and... While he's in safety, you know, he starts to worry about the people that were behind him and, you know, the people that got hurt in this in this ordeal. And the Archduke decides that he actually wants to go to the hospital to see these people and to kind of talk to these people and, you know, to make them feel better. And so he that's what he decides to do. And he gets back in his car with his wife. And, you know, at this point, all the other conspirators had kind of left, you know, they had kind of dispersed in with the crowds, um, especially once the chaos kind of happened of the first attack, and, you know, they had dispersed, they figured this was all over, so, you know, the story goes that the Archduke, he was in this car, and they went down this, this one road that happened to kind of, um, at the same time, he goes down this kind of small road that this car essentially stalls out, you know, these are old cars, and not super easy to drive, and, you know, there's all sorts of problems with these old cars, and he, the car stalls out uh, right on, in, on this kind of small road in between, you know, an alleyway, essentially, and who happens to be there? Uh, the One of the other conspirators, and the conspirator's name is actually Gavrilo Princep, and he was a member of this Black Hand, and he just happens to kind of coincidentally be in this spot, and sure enough, you know, the Archduke was there, um, he pulls out a pistol and fires shots and kills the Archduke and his wife, um, and this is going to be the event that essentially sets a chain of events in motion that is going to be essentially very hard to stop. Uh, and Gavrilo Princip arguably is has had the single most influence of any human being, uh, you know, in the last hundred years, you know, a hundred and a little over a hundred years at this point, um, uh, because arguably without this assassination, you don't get the war, and then without the war, you know, you don't get all the lead up to the Second World War and all of the, you know, everything that came out of that. So, you know, this this event right here is extremely, extremely important, and. What this sets forth is known as the July Crisis. Uh, think of it like a grenade. Uh, you basically have, you know, the pin pulled from the grenade at the assassination assassination of the Archduke. Uh, you know, Austria Hungary, uh, since the Archduke was the heir to the throne, is very angry. Uh, they feel that they need to go to war with Serbia to kind of save face. You know, the nationalist pride is is hurt of this country, and they need to do something about it. But as we've learned, you know, you have all of these different entangling alliances. And if that were to happen, essentially, you're going to get this all of these different countries being dragged in. And at some point, you know, some people say that this grenade, you know, this pin could have been put back in the grenade and this didn't necessarily need to get out of hand as it did. But the problem is, is you're going to have this essentially this race to mobilize the different nations. Um, mobilization is just simply a gathering of resources and soldiers and things like that, you know, in preparation for war. But the problem is, is what happens if one of these nations were to strike and the other one wasn't ready? So, you know, this race to mobilize is on and it's super important because everyone is really worried about where this is going to go. Stepping away from just that for a second, I just kind of want to mention that World War I is going to be a very different war than what had been fought in a long time. You know, this is the first major war in Europe in roughly a hundred years since the Napoleonic era. You know, of mo you're going to have mobilization of this magnitude anyway. And, you know, this is an extremely iconic photograph 
taken from World War One. This is actually a colorized version of the original black and white photograph um, that was done by a user on Reddit, actually. Uh, but this is the iconic photograph, right? You have this soldier who's wielding, you know, a new rifle, and he's got this pike, uh, but he's wearing a gas mask, which is, you know, a very new invention um, as a result of you know what's going to be happening in the war but he's still on a horse you know so you have this kind of old world meeting this industrialized new world attitude and it's going to, it's going to be really the big factor that makes this war so interesting and at the same time so incredibly devastating so what are the new things that you know you're going to experience in this war you know in 1914, the world is going to be a very, very different place than when it is in 1918 at the end of this war. You know, throughout the war and, and at the beginning of the war, you're going to have some major technological advancements in how to deal with the problems that each side were facing in this war. But, you know, a lot, some of the new weaponry that we're going to see, are, and, and for starters, is this in, incredibly increased uh, artillery, you know, these improved cannons, uh, these higher quality rifles, you know, both are going to shoot significantly farther and more accurately. You know, these cannons are going to shoot tremendous amounts of shells, um, you know, throughout the course of this war that are different types of shells now. You're going to have explosive shells and shrapnel shells and you're going to have, you know, gas shells and all different um, engineering of these shells and what they do when they explode. Um, that are it, it's going to make this life for these soldiers in in the trenches you know extremely extremely difficult and it's just a horrible place to be uh, you know the rifles uh, you're going to have repeating guns you know machine guns at this point that are shooting you know hundreds of rounds per minute um, which is at is going to be a major problem f for the people that are making these advances in this war. Uh, poison gas is going to be, you know, one of the horrible legacies of this war. Uh, you're going to see the beginnings of the implementation of using airplanes for thing for reconnaissance and things like that. Uh, you're not going to get any real bombardment and bombing, you know, except till maybe at the end of the war. But I um, mean, you know, there's stories of the first pilots, you're going to have dogfighting with the pilots actually holding pistols uh, in the planes as they're flying around, which is just a, a kind of a funny image, you know, in comparison to what we have today. Um, you know, tanks are going to be a new implementation in this war, mostly as a what means of dealing with the trenches, you know, they, they're meant to be able to actually kind of drive over these trenches to cut through and drive through the barbed wire that's going to act as bottlenecks for the soldiers. Uh, you know, this is going to be a tremendously different war technologically than had been fought ever. And it, it's going to really, really affect uh, how this war is going to be, especially early on. So as I was saying before, you're going to have this kind of race to mobilize and you know I, I've heard a really good analogy uh, that can kind of makes puts this into consideration that you I think you should be considering anyway uh, it's this idea of that what happens if you have a war and only one side shows up because the other side is simply just not ready and they haven't been able to mobilize their troops and get their equipment and things like that ready so if one side mobilizes faster and gets to their objectives before the other person can even mobilize any sort of defense, you know, what's going to happen? Um, so each of these countries, these nations, you know, had had extensive plans on kind of how they were going to deal with a war should it actually break out. And the biggest example of this is known as the German Schlieffen Plan. And this is essentially a plan for Germany to implement and, and how they think that they could win this war. So if you remember, let's go back a second to our entangling alliances. The agreements that had happened prior to the war aren't going to exactly shake out completely. Um, but you know, this is what you see here is actually, you know, how this is going to break out and many of the different 
groups that are going to be fighting and there's more than just what you see here um, you're going to see a map in a second kind of showing that even a little bit more um, but these are you know some of the major powers that we're talking about right so the central powers you have Germany Austria Hungary the Ottoman Empire and Bulgaria um, being you know one of some of the big ones Bulgaria obviously being significantly smaller than the three above it um, your Entente powers you know France is going to take the major burden of this war but you know so are Great Britain and Russia you know Serbia was the one that the Austria-Hungarian Empire in the first place declared war on, um, which had Russia kind of acting as a defender to the Slavic people of Serbia, uh, which is kind of what gets this all in motion in the first place, because once Russia gets in, then it drags France in. So Austria-Hungary, you know, once they start this war, they're making sure that Germany's going to back them up, and then everything else kind of just falls into place. So looking at this map, uh, you know, one thing I really want you to notice is Germany's location in Europe. Um, the big factor in the idea of the Schlieffen Plan is that Germany knows that Russia and France has this agreement. And to them, they're extremely worried about the idea of having to fight a two-front war. Um, that's that's really the the major concern of the central powers, right? Central being essentially centrally centrally located, um, and being centrally located, it has you know your enemies on both sides. So, to Germany's credit, one thing that they had thought of at this time is that France was significantly more of an industrialized and modern country than Russia was at this point. Russia had significant numbers and they were, you know, industrializing and they were, you know, going to be powerful too and they were super formidable, but Germany realized that Russia didn't have a lot of the the capabilities that France did and how quickly that they could mobilize. In fact, they, they thought that Russia essentially would mobilize significantly slower than France. So the Schlieffen plan going back has Germany believing that if they more or less throw everything that they have at France, then by doing this, that if they were to quickly overwhelm France and break through and, and do what they needed to do, then essentially they could finish the war and wrap the war up quickly in the West and then swing back to the Eastern Front and deal with Russia, who was going to be slower to mobilize. And that's kind of the whole premise of the Schlieffen Plan in the first place. This plan is going to kind of rely on, on something that's not necessarily actually going to work out for the Germans, and it's going to ultimately slow the German uh, movement into France down to a point where it's going to hurt them and hurt the whole idea of the Schlieffen Plan in the first place. And that is essentially relying on the neutrality of Belgium. So basically, along the borders of France and Germany, you have this these tensions and you had this militarism and buildup of defenses and things like that so it really wouldn't have been necessarily easy to push through these this area especially with this many number of troops so German's plan was essentially to travel through Belgium, uh, which was actually a neutral country, which is the real problem for Germany in the first place, uh, and then s basically get around the French flank from the north and kind of swing down uh, to Paris and ultimately capture the capital. So Germany ha has to do this. To them, the only way that they can actually win this war is to follow this plan and, and do it correctly and execute it correctly. And that this is where you're going to get a problem because as the Germans mobilize, you know, so many troops, we're talking over a million troops, um, you know, pouring through this neutral country, Belgium, uh, you know, I've heard this this comparison and story that basically you have uh, this this line of troops ready to make, make their way through Belgium and basically, you know, at the front of this line, they start moving and the back of the line doesn't actually start moving for over 24 hours. So you have these, these towns in Belgium basically watching this just you know definitive line of german troops moving through you know for hours and hours you know 24 hours or more um you know on their way through so 
the big fateful decision here is that Belgium actually decides that they are not okay with this. And Belgium actually is going to, in a very heroic gesture, actually attack the German forces moving through Belgium. And this is going to kind of change the whole course of the war potentially because in doing so, it doesn't allow the Germans to actually get th um, through as quickly as they needed to uh, into France. The last little piece of this puzzle is that Belgium's neutrality had an agreement with England. Uh, England. England had an agreement with Belgium that they were going to actually protect Belgium's neutrality. So when Belgium actually goes to fight uh, you know, the Germans in Belgium and the Germans obviously engage the Belgians, uh, you are going to have England finally make the decision that they're actually going to f engage in this war and fight on, on behalf of the Allied forces, the Entente powers, and that is going to be a very fateful thing as well because without the British, the French would have likely been overrun as well early on in this war. And I really can't emphasize enough how close this plan actually was to succeeding. Uh, Germany gets within actually only 25 miles of Paris uh, along this river that's known as the Marne, and you're going to basically have the what have this uh, this line of German troops you know flanking around from the north and the problem is is as they get farther into France these lines are going to kind of open up and you're going to have some gaps in these lines and that what happens is instead of kind of continuing on to towards Paris you're going to actually have the Germans kind of swing back um, to kind of close off these lines and what that does is that buys the the Entente powers just enough time and the French enough time that they're able to kind of come up and ultimately mount a defense against this German force on the Marne and you're going to get what's known as the miracle of the Marne at the first battle uh, and you, this is going to be a huge, huge battle. We're talking, you know, over two and a half million men involved, and these are numbers that are staggering. Um, these are numbers that we, you had never been seen before, really. And we're going to have, you know, over the course of this six-day battle, you're going to have almost 500, you know, thousand casualties, uh, and that's going to be a major, major, you know, show to these people, right? It, it, it shows that the technologies and things like that are, are, are absolutely devastating. And what's going to happen is once this gets slowed down, you're going to get uh, what's known as a stalemate. And basically neither side is able to kind of either push back or, you know, advance too much because of the of the power of these technologies and, you know, the show of force that these technologies have. And ultimately, you're going to get these stalemates leading to what's known as trench warfare. And between the stalemates and the new technologies, you're just going to get these tremendous, tremendous numbers of World War I. Um, you know, the numbers you can see right there, you know, we're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of casualties, if not millions of casualties in certain actual battles. You know, these battles aren't necessarily afternoon affairs. Some of these battles take month or more, um, you know, but you're going to see you know, millions of, of people being killed in these battles, and it's just, it's just staggering. You know, there's a very famous line by Joseph Stalin, uh, who would said that basically, you know, one death is a tragedy, and a million is a t statistic. And I think it's really easy to look at numbers and be like, oh yeah, you know, a million people died here, or a hundred thousand people died here, and to really forget what that actually means you know, on the human side, in the human element of this all. You know, when we when we talk about the Iraq war today, you know, when we talk about a couple thousand casualties, you know, it, it's it's horrible, right? This is a lot, that's a lot closer to us, um, you know, as a society today. And when you're looking back at these people, you know, at, and at this, these numbers from World War One, it's easy to kind of overlook that aspect of it all. So what is trench warfare? Uh, basically, each side realized that 
it was a complete utter waste of human life and human capital to have their men above ground. And basically, the longer you stayed above ground, uh, the new techno with the new technologies, it was basically signing your own death warrant on some levels. So. What happened is, is people started to dig, you know, underground tunnels and, and these trenches uh, that basically allowed them to, you know, operate and, and still be able to actually, you know, be at the front of this war. And what happened is, you know, you're going to basically get a mirror image on both sides. You're going to get these rows of trenches and you're going to have this land in the middle. Uh, that's going to actually be where much of the fighting actually take place, known as no man's land, because no one's going to want to be there. And so this image here kind of shows that, I think, pretty well. Uh, you're going to have these kind of parallel lines you know, of trenches, and you're going to have kind of lines that kind of go perpendicular to allow supplies and you know, movements of, of things like that um, to be able to, to get supplies and other men you know, from one spot to the other. Um, but basically, you're going to have the, these lines of, of these trenches, and what that's going to allow is you have m multiple lines and you have different areas in between so that even if one of these lines get overrun because of the way they are actually formed you have some space in between and you basically you're not going to basically take too much of it because of the different types of technologies and things it's so so difficult to spread yourself that thin and then ultimately keep taking you know line after line of these trenches you know there's a decent amount of space in between them uh, it basically creates a second no man's land after the first one uh, and you're gonna basically have you know artillery support in the back and machine guns essentially um, that's gonna you know mow down these troops as they try to attack these lines and we're talking you know pushes of numerous numerous people we're talking thousands of men you know actively trying to attack these positions and they're not getting anywhere you know one of the big things about this war is that the leadership in the war really is slow to grasp the the actual weight of of these technologies and their implications for them they don't really ever adapt their strategies to deal with it until much later in the war and later in the war you're almost gonna instead of dealing with it you're just gonna embrace it and you're just gonna try to slaughter as many people as you can so that's you know one of the reasons why this war just gets so completely out of hand and so such a horrible horrible place to be for your average average soldier so you know, this this right here shows the no man's land. You have barbed wire. So basically, you know, you have this group from the opposite side, you know, charging this this fortification essentially, and they run into the barbed wire, and that leads to a problem, right? If you can't get through the barbed wire, uh, you have a problem. So what happens is, you know, maybe a whole breaks uh, in this barbed wire and essentially now you have 20,000 people or some cases you know rushing to try to get to their side and you have this one hole and you create what's known as a bottleneck effect you know everyone's trying to get through this small hole in the barbed wire so you know as they're breaking through this uh, you have machine guns just essentially fixed on this these positions just mowing these large numbers of troops down and you know we're talking you know thousands and thousands of troops being killed day after day after day because you know you're gonna get this this these leadership that just doesn't adapt and you know these old techniques of just putting numbers into a problem and hoping it's gonna work out you know it, it really just becomes absurd because they just don't ever adapt and they just keep thinking it's gonna work or they keep hoping it's gonna work anyway and you, that leads to you know the thousands and thousands and millions of casualties that you're gonna actually see in this war This slide basically just says what I more or less reiterated in the last one. You know, this new weaponry essentially making it too deadly for the humans to be just simply above ground, which leading to the trenches. Uh, you know, at least to the stalemates and these doom charges that are over and over again. Um, you know, thousands of being killed essentially for minimal gains, if, if any gains at all, in either direction. And 
you know, these people in the trenches are going to be experiencing a whole lot more than just what we just said. You know, those are all problems, obviously, of course, as well. But you're going to get to a point where they're going to start using poison gas as well, um, which is a, you know, a horrible, horrible thing that these people had to deal with. It essentially kind of burns your lungs from the ins inside out and rots you from the inside out. Um, you know, they, they, these men in the trenches had to deal with the exposure to the elements, just like really any soldiers pretty much have had to do, um, you know, but the exposure to weather, you know, cold, heat, uh, you name it, whether it's snowing or if it's raining, um, you know, they're going to have... Uh, no drainage, no proper drainage in these trenches, and you know their feet are going to be consistently wet, and this is where trench foot comes from. Uh, the trench foot's going to be a problem. Uh, basically, you have the your skin just gets so bogged, so soggy essentially, and it's wrinkles, and right, it it gets essentially just you have that wrinkled feet, you know, for long periods of time, and essentially your your skin more or less just rubs off in your boots over the course of time eventually you know if it's really bad exposing your bone which is incredibly incredibly painful you're gonna have you know exposure to diseases and different things like that in the trenches in fact you're gonna have um, one of the largest influenza outbreaks you know in human history during this time it's gonna kill millions of people um, you're gonna have this constant shelling you know of, of millions and millions of shells being fired off you know in this war that are loud that are exploding around you you're getting almost no sleep you know the it this is a horrible place to be and these people are here for a really long periods of time sometimes uh, you know it's really really tough and it it I wouldn't ever want to be there, that's for sure. This is really just a great photograph uh, that shows all of these expended shells I was just talking about, right? You know, millions and millions of shells and munitions boxes, you know, in the, in the back in the picture there, um, you know, showing how many of these were actually being fired off. You know, this, this goes on for, for a long while behind this man in the center there. Um, you know, and, and these millions of shells are, are making life incredibly difficult and incredibly hectic for the men on the trenches and on the front lines of the war. This is another great photograph uh, that shows the devastation that happens and occurs, you know, between these areas between the trenches, you know, in these no man lands, if you will. Um, you know, you have the, the one soldier kind of walking along the trench there in, in, in the bottom, um, but you can see all these devastated trees, and it's essentially a wasteland, you know, in the middle with all of these shells being fired and all the, the guns and the machine guns and, you know, everything that's going on in the middle, you know, that's the type of environment that these people are kind of running through and in these doomed charges we were just talking about. The conditions that these people faced in the trenches are really going to bring out, you know, some of the, the horrors uh, of war and some of the horrible things people can do to each other. Um, but it's also going to bring out some of the best things that people can do to one another. And I have two really awesome primary sources, and I'm, I'm sorry for the wall of text you're going you're gonna to see on both of them, um, but I'm going to read these to you, and I just kind of want to give you the feeling that these people were going through, um, you know, on this whole spectrum of human emotion that, that they're seeing in, in this war. So this is uh, from a soldier named T. Bradley. Um, it's, it is quoted from a source called the in Escoli the Monsar, Monstar, um, and this is from page 63. So French shells began to hit to the right and to the left of us. Soon the French drum fire engulfed us. The air was filled with gas and flying pieces of steel. We automatically mounted the machine gun for action. Then, like animals, we burrowed into the earth as if trying to find protection deep in its bosom. A boy to my side was hit in the arm and cried out for help. I crawled over to him, ripped the sleeves of his coat, and shirt open and started to bind the bleeding part. The gas was so thick now, I could hardly discern what I was doing. My eyes began to water and I felt as if I would choke. I reached for my gas mask, pulled it out of its container, and then noticed to my horror that a splinter had gone through it leaving a large hole. I had seen death a thousands of times, stared it in the face, but never experienced the fear I felt then. Immediately, I reverted to the primitive. I felt like an animal cornered by hunters. With the instinct of self-preservation uppermost, my eyes fell on the boy whose arm I had bandaged. Somehow he had managed to put the gas mask on his face with his one good arm.
I leapt at him, and in the next moment had ripped the gas mask off, off from his face. With a feeble gesture, he tried to wrench it from my grasp, and then fell back exhausted. The last thing I saw before putting on the mask were his pleading eyes. I really feel like this is one of those quotes that really just says it all. Um, you know, it really just shows the desperation uh, that some people you know, felt in war and what they had to deal with and, you know, how primitive it really was, you know, when it really comes down to it, if it's you versus me, you know, I'm gonna more or less act for me every single time and, you know, obviously you have these these stories of war heroes acting, you know, selflessly, but I think when it comes down to it, many people are gonna act on some level very much like this person and, you know, it I think it's really important to show this range of emotions of what war actually brings out on people. And because of that, you know, I want to show you this next one, too, uh, from a man named Ernst, Ernst Junger, um, who was a very decorated soldier uh, in, from the Germans who basically fought throughout the entirety of the First World War uh, and made his story, you know, he brought his story to us in, by writing a book. And this is, you know, just a part of the book um, early on in his in his career as a soldier here, um, that I think is really worth showing the opposite of what we just saw. So he says, quote, then I saw my first enemy, wounded apparently. I turned a corner and we caught sight of each other. I saw him jump as I approached and stare at me with gaping eyes, while I, with my face behind my pistol, stalked up to him slowly and coldly. A bloody scene with no witnesses was about to happen. It was a relief to me, finally, to have a foe in the front of me and within reach. I set the mouth of the pistol at the man's temple. He was too frightened to move, while my other fist grabbed a hold of his tunic. With a plaintive sound, he reached into his pocket, not to pull out a weapon, but a photograph, which he held up to me. I saw him on it, surrounded by numerous family, all standing on a terrace. It was a plea from another world. Later I thought it was blind chance that I let him go and plunged onward that one man of all often appeared in my dreams. I hope that means he got to see his homeland again. You know, this is a case where it was the opposite, right? Um, he didn't have to kill this man, and he realized that, and, you know, he recognized that he was just another one of these people that was caught up in this, this conflict of, this larger conflict of, of these, you know, these leaders of these countries, and, you know, he realized that this person probably wasn't much different than himself and you know he was probably brought to the war in very similar circumstances as he was and by letting him go it, it just shows the opposite right that this this doesn't need to happen uh, you know that all of these people um, are, are m many cases the exact mirrors of each other you know from the opposite country you know the only thing different that's separating them is a line uh, of culture um, but you know a farmer in France is is pretty much exactly like a farmer in Germany they just speak different languages um, and you know it's the people that really really suffered it's your average person that really suffered in this war um, and you're gonna have so many men you know you're gonna have over 10 million deaths by the end of World War one and you're gonna essentially have just a generation of, of men more or less just wiped out because of of what we were just talking about you know this blatant disregard for human life and it, it's 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 tragic it really is this is a very famous uh, painting by a man named John Singer Sargent that just kind of shows the effects of things like the poison gas. It's actually entitled Gassed. And you have this line of soldiers, you know, you, they're, they have these bandages on their eyes, they're, they got arms on, you know, on the shoulder in, in the person in front of them, and they're basically being led uh, to one can assume to, you know, a military hospital or medic tent or something like that to get treatment. Um, but, you know, the sad reality is that many of these people probably aren't going to actually make it. You see all of the men, you know, that are either dead or dying kind of collapse on the ground around them. Um, you know, in similar situations, they have the bandages on, um, you know, and this gas is just one of those horrible things that people, you know, were able to do and they did no problem to the other people um, as a means of, in a hopes of winning this war and this, this mustard gas, which is actually essentially just chlorine gas, um, 
essentially rots your your lungs out and burns your lungs from the inside and boils your skin and burns your skin and your eyes uh, you know and over the course of you know a, a you know a decent amount of time it's going to actually mostly kill you and it's an extremely agonizing and painful death and it's just it's just a horrible way to go and again you know this is just one of these things that these these powers are doing to one another in attempts to to get the better hand and get the upper hand but it, it's just again one of these tragic things of this war and it's it's just horrible so now that we have really set the stage of kind of the the way this war was being fought and what led to this war, we need to take a step now away from Europe and kind of discuss the United States and ultimately what was going on in the United States and, and, and our policy and such like that. And the president at the time, whose name was Woodrow Wilson, really, really wanted to remain neutral in this war. Um, you know, when it really comes down to it, if you think about it, the, the country, the United States, was a country of immigrants at this time, right? At this point, uh, you've had you know 50 or so years of, of relatively you know, of, of large numbers of immigration going into the United States, and at the time, about one third of the country was actually either foreign-born themselves or simply children of immigrants. And the the real issue with that is that some of these immigrants were actually sympathetic to you know the central powers and some of them were actually sympathetic to the allies so let's just think you know if you actually have you know a few million germans you know ethnic germans in the united states if the united states were to take a position against germany what's going to happen you know are these people going to become insurgent fighters against the United States in the United States uh, you know how are they going to react uh, you know they don't really know um, so and and that could be this case any other side right if they had taken the side of the of the Germans in the war then how would you know the other European descendants in in America handle that so you know the key terms here are neutrality which is just really one side not favoring either of the sides, which is really going to be the United States' policy. Uh, and another word that you're going to need for a, just a little bit is propaganda, which is essentially is just information that is being portrayed you know, and designed to actually influence opinion toward a certain means. So America's early involvement, again, looked to remain neutral, right? And by doing so, they, they were open to trade with both Germany and, and Great Britain. Uh, they didn't really have any preference. Uh, they just didn't want to get caught up in this war early on. And when it comes down to it, the British didn't really allow this to happen. You know, the U.S. would have been okay trading with Germany, but the British, with their tremendous navy at the time, uh, were more or less blocking the you know the the path into Germany, into the North Sea, um, into the Baltic Sea. You know, that would allow the access to the German coast. And with this blockade, you know, the U.S. really wouldn't have been able to trade with Germany at all. Uh, so when it really comes down to it, the other allies and Great Britain in particular were benefiting from, you know, the U.S. support and this trading support that Germany wasn't. And this is going to be a really big factor in this war, because if you think about it, this war is really going to be a major war of attrition. You know, the, the best analogy that I've ever heard is kind of think of it like you have these big, big heavyweight boxers basically fighting each other. You know, and these heavyweight fighters are, you know, Germany and France and Great Britain and Austria, Hungary, and you know they've all essentially beefed up and they've trained, you know, and, and gotten ready for this fight. And when the fight breaks, you know, it really comes down to who is going to basically deal the most punches and who is going to be able to take the most punches. And the thing about industrialized nations. You know, with all of the human capital that they have, you know, and the increases of human population at the time mixed with the technological advancements, they're really going to be able to take a whole lot of punches. And that's going to be good on some level for the war effort because you're going to be able to sustain a war effort longer. But at the same time, it's going to be problematic because by sustaining that war effort longer, 
you're going to suffer more and more casualties and you're going to basically exhaust your resources and in, especially in cases you know in France where this fighting is being ta is taking place you're just going to have complete and utter devastation of your of your land as a result of that so the longer and longer this goes on you know the more and more your your fighters are going to be essentially damaged and be worn out so this blockade is really going to be a factor in this because Germany is not going to be getting that support and you know in a war of attrition over the course of you know a number of years this is going to partially be what does them in And Germany realized this, and as a result of realizing this, they, knowing they're not really able to compete with the the British Navy entirely, uh, they actually develop what are known as submarines, and they're called German U-boats. And these German U-boats uh, announce, basically, and Germany announces their policy, they're going to more or less attack ships you know heading for British Harbor with these submarines and this type of policy is going to um, be one of the things that starts to set it in motion that the United States is going to be joining the Allied side eventually in this war. So the first piece of the puzzle you know, that gets the United States into this war is the sinking of the Lusitania on May 7th 1915. And the Lusitania was actually a British passenger liner, uh, and the reason that it was sunk was because the Germans felt that it was actually carrying arms and ammunition, you know, and things like that to the Allies from America, and that that's the reason it was sunk, uh, and you're going to have over a thousand people being killed altogether, and 128 of them, you know, were United States citizens, and. This is going to create an uproar, obviously, in the United States. If you actually go into the notes, uh, you can click that link. It'll give you a little bit of a you know video from History.com talking about the Lusitania a little bit more. But it actually turned out uh, later, you know, that there were actually munitions and arms on board. So the Germans were actually right, and this is one of those really gray area kind of situations. You know, the Germans they need to prevent these supplies from getting to the Allied hands, you know, if they have a hope of winning this war from, from the longevity standpoint, you know, the longer this goes, the less of a chance they're going to have to win because of it. But, you know, the British were disguising this on regular passenger liners, so on some level they were putting these people at risk, you know, in doing so and allowing this to happen. So it's really hard to say who was actually right here and that's one of this major gray area uh, for sure but obviously you know at the time all of these countries denied it you know the United States denied it uh, Britain denied it obviously that these munitions were there and it was really just a, a dark stain against you know public support for Germany in the United States you know having killed 128 American citizens This is actually a picture uh, from a German U-boat after having sunk uh, some Allied uh, shipping vessels in, in the Atlantic Ocean. I think that's just a cool picture to kind of show this stuff that we're talking about, uh, bring it a little more to life, which is one of the great reasons why this era of history, you know, you, you can actually do that in comparison to earlier times in, in history. And... As Germany realizes that this shipping is going to be even more and more problematic to them um, in this war of attrition, you're going to get a policy from the Germans known as unrestricted submarine warfare. And this is going to kind of start in January 1917. Uh, the Lusitania actually wouldn't, uh, wasn't what gets the United States involved. In fact, the United States is going to, to not get involved. And there's going to be a lot of debate about it. Um, but ultimately, Woodrow Wilson is, is not going to get, get fall into this trap and fall into the war. Um, but this, this unrestricted submarine warfare is really going to be one of the the straws that breaks the camel's back, if you will, um, 
and it's going to really anger Woodrow Wilson, who's going to break diplomatic ties with Germany um, as a result of it. And you're also going to get the intercept of a telegraph, a telegram from Germany uh, to Mexico known as the Zimmerman telegram, which is going to be one of the last, you know, straws here that brings the United States, obviously, into this, this conflict, in a physical capacity anyway. So this is a photograph of the actual telegram, uh, the Zimmerman telegram, and I'm just going to read it right here. So that, remember, this is from Germany to Mexico. We intend to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, in spite of this, to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this will not succeed, uh, we will make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. If we make war together make peace together. Generous financial support and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you. You will inform the president of the above most secretly as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States of America is certain and add the suggestion that he should, on his own initiative, invite Japan to immediate adherence and at the same time mediate between Japan and ourselves. Please call the President's attention to the fact that the ruthless employment of our submarines now offers the prospect of compelling England in a few months to make peace. So let's break this down for a second. I think there's a you know, number of parts here that I think we need to talk about um, for sure. So basically, what Germany's plan here at this point in the war, um, you know, again, this, from this war of attrition standpoint, they wanted to make this war so a ghastly, you know, so ghastly to the British public that they were going to get out of it. And that's kind of what they say at the very end, right? This submarine, this understood submarine warfare, destroying all of the shipping vessels, you know, going into England, um, basically, they're saying is going to compel Britain and the people of Britain to ultimately to no longer fight in this war, right? If you don't have these supplies going in, people are going to start, uh, you know, starving and, you know, you know, food and things like that, not making it to, to Britain. Uh, they're going to have to keep rationing and all of these different things. And, you know, it's going to basically compel the, the British public to, to drop out of the war. And that's what they're really hoping for. But the, the wild card in this situation is the United States. Uh, and the United States, you know, had obviously been kind of towing that line and, and sending support over, just not actually getting, you know, fully committing to the war yet. So Germany is worried about the United States, but he, Germany anyway, feels that if they're able to compel England to get out of this war, they would actually be able to finish the war against the French uh, more quickly and before the United States could actually get there. So in a hope to stall the United States, this offer is sent to Mexico uh, that if you know the United States is looking like they're going to join the war, if Mexico were to attack them from the south and stall the United States, Germany could ultimately finish the war in Europe and then come to the aid of Mexico in this fight against the United States. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the hope of, of Germany here. And ultimately, uh, this telegram is intercepted by the British. And of course, the British having, having this message that was sent, they showed the Americans, and the Americans are not too thrilled about it, obviously. Some other reasons for the United States' entry into World War I uh, are seen here. So, for starters, the United States had lent, you know, a large amount of financial support to Europe, uh, being whether, you know, arms and munitions or actual money. Uh, you know, the Allies uh, had received, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from America, and America realized, and this is kind of a little bit underneath all of it, you know, in the, in the cogs that turn underneath, you know, all of this going on, um, you know, Americans, uh, you know, government realized that this money, should it, you know, it was lent out, and if the Allies didn't win the war, then 
it's not necessarily going to be paid back. So, so to ensure this, you know, they needed the Allies to win, and in order for the Allies to win, it, it kind of needed to get involved in the war. Um, you know, all in addition to that, you know, as from a business opportunity standpoint for America, you know, if the United States actually entered into the war. A lot of American companies are going to be providing resources, uh, you know, to this effort, and they're going to make a substantial amount of money involved in it all. And this is kind of one of those, you know, things that are going on beneath the surface. You know, this is one of these the other reasons for it that play out. You know, versus the other stuff that's a lot more external. Another last part of it, you know, in, in addition to the submarine warfare, you know, the unrestricted submarine warfare, and, and Wilson stating in his warm message, you know, that they're looking to make the world safe for democracy, uh, you know, that also deals with the Russian Revolution. Uh, you know, don't forget that, that that is what ultimately makes Russia leave the war and kind of allow, you know, a bit more of a push uh, by the Germans, you know, at the Western Front um, since the Russians kind of fall off and that Eastern Front's going to need to kind of be re reinvigorated by the Allies and actually... One thing that's really often forgotten or really not mentioned too much is that the Allies actually have a brief incursion into Russia at the tail end of this war, you know, by the United States and by Britain and the other Allies against the Bolsheviks that had overthrown, you know, the government in in Russia. Uh, they, you know, they fought the Red Army and couldn't really make any real substantial you know, changes in any, any major substantial victories or anything like that against the Red Army to help the the support of the government, actually, you know, the regular government in Russia, um, and it really didn't go anywhere, and, you know, after the, this war and people dying from the big Spanish flu that's going on and stuff, you know, you get the calls for bringing the troops home and stuff, so it doesn't really end up going anywhere, but, you know, this is something that's really important that and often left out. This is just a picture of American troops arriving in Russia in 1918, um, you know, based off of kind of what we were just talking about that I think is just is relevant and important um, and then often, again, not often talked about. So Woodrow Wilson is an interesting character, right? You know, during this time, he basically had done his best efforts to keep America neutral in this war. And, in fact, he runs for his second term as president, basically under the slogan that, you know, he kept us out of the war. Uh, and this is just a, a piece from his war message, you know, describing to the American public why the United States is going to war. I'm going to read this to you guys here. Uh, so, quote, I am not now thinking of the loss of property involved, immense and serious as that is, but only of the wanton and wholesale destruction of the lives of non-combatants, men, women, and children engaged in pursuits which have always, even in the darkest periods of modern history, been deemed innocent and legitimate. Property can be paid for. The lives of peaceful and innocent people cannot be. The present Ge German submarine warfare against commerce is a warfare against mankind. It is a war against all nations. American ships have been sunk, American lives taken, in ways which it has stirred us very deeply to learn of, but the ships and people of other neutral and friendly nations have been sunk and overwhelmed in the waters in the same way. There has been no discrimination. The challenge is to all mankind. Each nation must decide for itself how it will meet it. The choice we make for ourselves must be made with a moderation of counsel and temperateness of judgment befitting our character and our motives as a nation. We must put excited feelings away. Our motive will not be revenge or the victorious assertion of the physical might of the nation, but only the vindication of right, of human right, and which we are only a single champion. That is being sold as the, you know, the reasons why the United States is actually going to get into this war, but obviously there's going to be some opposition to that as well. And this is just a, a quote from a senator at the time in 1917 uh, in you know, opposition to Wilson's war message we just read. So he says, We have loaned many hundreds of millions of dollars to the Allies in this controversy, and while such action was legal and 
countenanced by international law, there is no doubt in my mind, but the enormous amount of money loaned to the Allies in this country has been instrumental in bringing about a public sentiment in favor of our country, taking a course that would make every bond worth a hundred cents on the dollar and making the payment of every debt certain and sure. Through this instrumentality and also through the instrumentality of others who have not only made millions out of the war and in manufacture of munitions, etc., and who would expect to make millions more if our country can be drawn into the catastrophe, a large number of the great newspapers and news agencies of the country have been controlled and enlisted in the greatest propaganda that the world has ever known to manufacture sentiment in favor of the war. And with that, uh, as he was just talking about, you're actually going to have the creation of what's known as the Committee on Public Information, and they are going to be responsible for mobilizing that public support you know, for the war. Uh, you just have an example of one of these propaganda posters that the senator was just discussing and talking about where you have um, this menacing looking figure uh, being called the Hun um, you know beat him back he's got this knife that's blood you know he's got blood on his fingers and on the knife uh, he's got the German helmet on you know obviously implying it's German um, he's a scary figure and basically saying you need to beat this person back by buying bonds buying Liberty bonds that are going to help finance the war um, you know the Committee on Public Information is responsible for you know pro-war pamphlets and propaganda pushing stories. You even have patriotic talks before uh, movies and things like that. There are these called these four minute men that they would deliver these rousing four minute speeches, um, you know, trying to rally public support for this war. One thing that's also often left out when discussing war is kind of what the war is like on the home front, you know, these troops, uh, you know, what they're doing out on the actual real fronts, you know, when it really comes down to it, it's being sustained by the effort at home. And without that effort at home, you know, these people are not going to be able to keep that effort up for too long. And the front at home is equally as important. And the way that they're paying for the war, for starters, you know, between taxes and other things, um, you have uh, what's known as bonds, war bonds, in this case, liberty bonds. And bonds are basically a loan to the government by, you know, your average citizen, basically, to help pay for this war. And you saw that propaganda poster a second ago um, just, you know, saying, you know, to, to influence people to buy these bonds to help finance the war. Other things that are you know, important to understand at the home is that people at home are making sacrifices. Uh, and one of the sacrifices that they're making is is called rationing. And basically they have to limit the use of products, uh, you know, and food for the war efforts and, you know, and things like that. Um, a good example of this uh, is that the copper in pennies, you know, actually, actually during World War II, um, is actually going to be n no longer going to be copper. They're going to make it steel. They're going to print it out, out of steel um, because the copper is going to be more important, you know, for the war effort. And this, this is this is total war efforts by these countries. And I think that's really something that we can't appreciate today because there hasn't been that kind of effort in, in a very long time since these two world wars. Um, but you know these sacrifices at home are are really important, and you know in addition to that, these countries had to produce the food and move the food and get the food, uh, you know food rations. So not to be mistaken as the other type of rations we were just talking about, but um, you know get the food rations to the war effort, you know of the Allies on on the fronts in Europe. Um, additionally, you know the factories uh, that were producing goods, you know from the industrialized industrialization that we had talked about not not very long ago um, you know it's gonna have to be converted as well these factories are going to be converted into creating uh, you know different different production for the war itself this is another great photograph uh, it is actually mountains of individual rations of food for the soldiers uh, you know it's a depot for for these rations before they actually get shipped out uh, to the front but it just kind of again just shows how much of an effort is actually you know behind the scenes of these wars you know the logistics are, are as equally as important as as the actual physical fighting itself 
as I was just saying, you know, the nation's industries are going to really have to expand for the war production. You're going to have tons of men that are going to actually be leaving the workforce, you know, to go and fight the war and sign up for the military or be drafted into the military. Um, you know, actually going to have over four million Americans be mobilized uh, for this war. Um, and when you take that many men out of circulation in 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 the workforce, you know, they're going to have to fill these gaps. And in some cases, women are actually going to be hired, you know, to do this job and I'm going to just zoom in here um, you can see you know these women are basically filling these these munitions right ammunition uh, for for the troops uh, on the front lines additionally to fill those gaps of the men leaving the workforce uh, to go fight this war, you're going to also have the beginnings of what's known as, you know, the African-American migration in, you know, between 1914 and 1920. And you're going to have even even larger um, migration, you know, during the 1920s. But between this time period, you're going to have roughly 300,000 to 500,000, you know, African-Americans leaving their home in the South, mostly to get a hopefully get a job in the north but really to escape a lot of that sentiment uh, that we were talking about that left over you know bitterness after the reconstruction efforts uh, you know on Plessy versus Ferguson and, and the legalized segregation uh, you can see on this this poster right here you know the reason um, you know implying you know that this is one of the reasons why they're heading to the north because you have the white gentleman um, basically having the, the lynched uh, african-american there in the background but you know, they were also going up for the jobs that were available and this promise of, you know, of, of a better life, hopefully. But when they got there, you know, you're going to have um, some issues with this, this influx of, of people going into these areas. Uh, you're going to actually have um, some race riots. You know, one example is in Illinois. You're going to have the burning of some of these people's houses, you know, actual um, firing upon these residents with guns and things like that. Um, so... This is just something that needs to be mentioned and discussed about some of the social, you know, aspects of, of this war. One of the reasons why the United States' involvement in the war was so important, at least from the United States social aspect, is that there were tremendous efforts you know, made by the United States government to essentially control public opinion. Uh, and in doing so, you have one of the, the single biggest crackdowns in, on American civil liberties in the United States in our nation's history. Um, for starters, you have the passing of what's called the Espionage Act, which was passed in 1917, and it's going to provide stiff penalties for espionage or spying, um, or as well as kind of aiding the enemy or interfering with army recruiting. And you're going to actually have a Supreme Court case um, up, upholding the conviction of of a man that basically uh, was speaking against the draft that we're going to be talking about just momentarily. Um, additionally, you have the Sabotage Act and Sedition Act, uh, which were laws basically making it crime to say or print or write almost anything perceived as negative you know, about the government. This is going to be seen as sabotage, and you could be convicted for that as well, uh, which you know is, is crazy to think about on some level in today's world. Um, but you know, at the time, the government was really acting to try to control the public and, and the message about the war uh, and how it's being perceived by your everyday person. And then the last aspect of this um, is actually the Selective Service Act, which was instituted in May 1917, not very long after uh, Wilson's war message. And it's going to actually require all men uh, to start between the ages of 21 and 30 to register for military service. Um, later on, this is going to actually expand uh, to the ages of 18 to 45. Um, and you're actually going to get out of this uh, and the messaging and of such with the propaganda and all that, about 2 million volunteers of the United States uh, joining up. And then about 2.8 million men actually being drafted drafted, uh, conscripted to fight in this war.
ultimately the United States' involvement is going to kind of finally tip the scales in the favor of the Allies, um, especially with both of these countries, uh, really at both sides, I should say, really being hurt, you know, and being worn out. And again, remember, think of these championship boxers that have, you know, completely exhausted themselves and broken each other down and beaten each other down into submission for, you know, for so long that the the bringing in a fresh power is going to really kind of finally tip the scales completely in the favor of of France and and the allies and such um however you know i think it's important to mention as well that if this war had gone on longer, you know, th these conditions might have lasted obviously a little while longer that we had talked about um but ultimately with the war of attrition that was going on, you know, it's likely that it would have ended in a similar capacity. Um but anyway, so Wilson's ideas uh, after the end of this war, um, he has this idea that's called the Wilson's 14 points. Um, and it's, you know, basically America's ideas and how European powers should kind of handle the end of this war. And some people say that, you know, if people had kind of followed Wilson's ideas, it would have kind of had a little bit more of a chance for for a lasting peace, as we all know that this is going to um, erupt into a, another world conflict, you know, not more, not much more than 20 years later. Um, so Wilson's points are really mostly ignored by the European powers, but the big thing that's going to come from it is the League of Nations. Uh, and the League of Nations is, is essentially see, is a precursor to what we you know, have today as the United Nations. And it was basically you know, an attempt to bring all of these different countries together um, you know, in, in hopes to preserve peace and essentially prevent future wars, uh, you know, pledging to respect and protect one another's territory and sovereignty and you know, all, all of this, this good stuff, uh, which is in theory is you know good but we obviously know it didn't necessarily work out um, and when this war is is ending uh, you have the armistice on uh, November 11th uh, in 1918 uh, at 11 11 11 um, which actually you know armistice day is a huge huge holiday around the world um, but these these peace talks that are going to come um, you know, out of the end of this war and ultimately the treaties that come are, are going to really set the tone going forward for the next 20 years in Europe um, even though they end the war and it's going to be really some harsh conditions against Germany and the other belligerents which we talked you know, more about the details actually in class but just to kind of sum up we're going to see them here in a second. So the Treaty of Versailles is the treaty specifically with Germany, um, and for starters, you know it is it's required Germany to essentially take the guilt of this war and basically take the blame for the war in this war guilt clause. Um, you know if you remember the Schlieffen Plan, the Germans actually felt obligated that they had to kind of act quickly and mobilize quickly and attack you know into France if they had any hope of wanting to win this war because if they didn't you know they'd ultimately be fighting it on two sides and they obviously fought it on two sides anyway but to them that was the only hope so they they were the ones that made this move on France even though they're you know that that pin hypothetically could have been could have still been put back in that grenade um, additionally you have these reparations which are basically it's just monetary payment um, to essentially ease some of the problems that came and to help these other countries rebuild the damage that that Germany had ensued you know in this fighting uh, the reparation debt was about 6.6 .6 billion pounds which you know in 1918 um, you know in comparison to now is, is a whole lot of money um, in fact it's so much money that it was actually only finally paid back in 2010 um, not very long ago uh, you have some major land sessions, um, basically some territory that you know, Germany had, had taken control of, had to be given back. Um, there had to be a buffer zone created between Germany and France where there was no military or anything allowed. Um, you had some severe limitations on the military might uh, of the country, you know, limitations on how many soldiers they could have, how many with their navy and submarines and airplanes and things like that that they could have, which essentially was nothing. Um, 
So these conditions, you know, are really, really harsh, and the reparations are going to lead to, you know, some of the economic conditions that we're going to, you know, be talking about of, you know, soon. Um, but you additionally have other treaties too, besides the Treaty of Versailles, and it's going to lead to, you know, similar conditions as what we just said, you know, to the other Central Powers nations, uh, and you know, in some cases, they these countries go bankrupt and they're unable to pay, and you know, when it really comes down to it, this guilt and most of the, you know, the weight of the, this war is actually short by Germany here um, but you know it's really important to sit, really say that this sets the stage for the conflicts and the frustration and the economic conditions and things like that leading up to the Second World War and the the sequel if you will As a way to kind of wrap this up, you know, I think it's important to look at the numbers and the scope and scale of this whole thing. You know, starting in July in 1914, ending in November 11, you know, 11th, 1918, um, you have this this chart here that basically shows, you know, all of the, the numbers, the grand numbers anyway, um, of of the how many troops were mobilized, you know how many were wounded and prisoners or missing or outright killed, um, you know it just kind of shows you know who shouldered the most the most of this. Um, you know obviously Russia uh, is at the top here with with the with mobilization, even though they were gonna you know leave uh, the war later. But you know the numbers are still big. I'm gonna kind of zoom in in here um, to get a, a closer look. Um, so. You know, Russia mobilized, you know, roughly 12 million people, Germany 11 million, Britain mobilized almost nine, France mobilized over eight and a half, you know, about eight and a half, um, you know, Austria. So you have these tremendous numbers of mobilization, right? This is a war and the scale of this war had never been seen before full national efforts and national armies um, you know you have about five million Russians killed um, no, I'm sorry uh, wounded um, you've got you're missing and you know killed um, and such down here um, you can just read the numbers yourself as I scroll down but these numbers are huge and huge staggering numbers to the final total numbers at the bottom um, you know, you have about 8.1 million uh, killed. You have about seven and a half million that were either taken as prisoners or just flat out missing. Uh, you have about almost 21 million that are going to get wounded during this, and you have about the mobilization of 62 million people. You know, and those numbers are just so utterly staggering in comparison to everything you know that we we've we have today, you know, and the idea of uh, any mobilization of this magnitude in today um, is, is is frightening. Um, so, you know, hopefully the lessons of this war and, you know, ultimately World War II um, will never allow something like this to ever happen again. So on that note, thank you very much for listening and goodbye.